I wonder if you caught the excitement of the, the news that starts to go around. Yeah, Christ is risen. I want to kind of blend some scriptures together for us this morning because I couldn't find one that worked for me. So um, I want to start by, um, by reading from John chapter 20. Uh, in my Bible, it's entitled The Empty Tomb, which is kind of appropriate. And it reads like this. On the first day of the week... Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out heading for the tomb. The two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Just a little editorial note. The other disciple, who's John, who's writing this. I just think it's really good. He says, I got there first. (laughs) And stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen clothes lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had, who had reached the tomb first, then also went in, saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. I'm, I'm intrigued by that. They, they, they were still trying to get their heads round what this meant that Christ had risen from the dead. And I kind of would like now to flip back a bit to John chapter 5, where Jesus says something really interesting, which I'm pretty sure at some point they will have gone back to in their thinking. So John chapter 5, and I want to pick it up from verse 19. Jesus is talking and he says, Truly I tell you, the Son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son likewise does these things. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. And just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son also gives life to whom he wants. The Son also gives life to whom he wants what what an amazing picture we've got of this this jesus who not only breaks free from a tomb but actually says he has the ability to give life and i'd like us to think about that life this morning i i I mean god god has given us life effectively twice over I hope you realize that first of all you were born yeah I'm looking around there seems to be life in some of the people here so you are definitely born yeah but also we have a new life in Christ that is only possible because of Jesus's death and resurrection this is not the same type of life and this, this is where um, it's, it's quite fascinating. We, we have to kind of wrap our minds around all that God is capable of doing and, and get to grips with this. But I want to talk briefly this morning about this resurrection life that Jesus has and that he invites us to share. The first thing I need to tell you about this life, this resurrection life, is it requires a death there's no resurrection Sunday without Good Friday 
There is no resurrection life until there is death. Our problem, our challenge is, I I look at you and you look at me and we think we're alive. Yeah? Because we're breathing. I can move around. I'm not still. I'm not, I'm still in this body. Um, I'm alive. And, And we think this is life. Jesus is talking about a different quality of life, a different type of life, a different form of life, a resurrection life that only comes to us when we embrace death. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 Around verse 25, he says, if you want to save your life, lose it. If you want to lose your life, just hang on to it. Try and hang on to it, you'll lose it. But if you lay down your life, you will find it. And what he's saying, he's pointing us to this resurrection life. We're saying, if we we live for ourselves, we live for this earth, we live for what we can, can do. I mean... A lot of us are looking forward to really nice Easter Sunday lunch, yeah? Few of us, maybe, yeah? Um, Maybe nice piece of roast lamb, or maybe it's just going to be a sandwich outside, I don't know. But you're looking forward to lunch because we we are living in this physical world and we are aware of our physical being, and we think it's all about this physical life. That's why when we get sick, we are desperate for healing, because we're anchored into this physical world. And we're afraid about physical death because we have no confidence, no hope for a future, an eternal life with God. And until we put to death our selfish existence, until we surrender to the very will and and life of God himself, we're not really living. Jesus said, I can only do what I see the Father doing. He was truly alive. He was totally surrendered to God in everything. Jesus also said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, take up your cross daily. Take up your cross daily. And every single day, If we want to be followers of Jesus every single day, we must wake up saying, God, I am willing to die today that I might live for you. I am willing to let my own selfish agenda, my own thoughts, everything I want can go, only what your will, your will be done. The Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's a complete and utter death of self that we might live for Christ. One of the reasons why I feel the church in this part of the world is so weak is we have not embraced death. Because we cannot live for Christ until we're prepared to die with Christ. All to Jesus. I surrender. Lovely hymn, lovely song, lovely words, hard to live. But if we want resurrection life, it's only found through death. Are we ready? to die that we might live you see this resurrection life it's a it's a new life it's a different life and and it's it's pictured for us beautifully by uh, Paul in Romans chapter 6 so I'd I'd just like to to read this part of Romans the beginning of Romans chapter 6 Paul's writing and he says what should we say then should we continue in sin that grace may multiply Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For, death, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. By the life he lives, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You see, this is a this is a new life. This is not this is not a continuation of an old life. And, and, and one of the things that I honestly, genuinely believe in the bottom of my heart is that there is a, there is a moment in life when you, your existence, when you have changed. I hope. <laughs> I know there was for me. There was, there was a life before Christ and there is a life after and with Christ. There is a life where I'm living for myself, I'm living to please myself, I'm concerned about what I've got for dinner, I'm concerned about whether I've got some nice clothes, um, if I'm old enough I'm concerned about a car that I might be able to drive. I live for myself, I spend my money on myself, I care about my own life and possibly those around me, like my family, maybe. Maybe my mum and dad, if they're nice to me. <laughs> But then we meet Jesus and all of a sudden our life changes. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. My life is radically transformed. The center of my universe is now Jesus. The center of all we are about should be Jesus. It should be serving him, loving him, following him, pleasing him, adoring him, worshipping him. Everything else should go by the... Now, okay, it may not happen just like that all in a moment for you. But you should see that change. And what I would cry out to you from the depth of my heart is if you haven't seen that change in your life, you need to die that you might live. Because this resurrection life is a new life. It's a different way of existing. It flows from God who is a spiritual being. It's a spiritual life. It's a life that's found in him alone. Jesus himself said, you must be born again. Yeah, you have to be spiritually born. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, you are now a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Yeah, the old has gone. Again, in, in Romans 16, 11, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ. All of this is, is about how we, this new life that God is offering us, it's on a different plane of existence. It's a spiritual life. Romans 11, uh, 8, 8, 11, it says his spirit is making us alive. In a few weeks time we will get to Pentecost uh, and you see you go through Good Friday you die, you go through Easter Sunday which is resurrection life and that's fulfilled, that, that life is released into the world at Pentecost when God pours out his spirit on all flesh and as God's spirit comes upon us we are made alive in Christ Jesus. If you're listening to me say these words and you're thinking to yourself, that sounds really good, but I can't quite relate to that. Well, then maybe you're not alive yet. And maybe you need to be born again. And it, just don't, it doesn't matter how long you've been coming to church. It doesn't matter how, long, how many sermons you've listened to. It doesn't matter how many times you've read, read the Bible or not read the Bible. If we haven't surrendered totally to Jesus and gone through that process of dying, 
we will not have resurrection life. So where are we today? Are we feeling the life? Or are we still struggling with life? Because this life, we don't have to die. We do have to die, but we have to die in order to have a new life. But this new life is a full life. In John 10, one of our favourite verses, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life in full, in abundance. And, and you know, it's very easy to misunderstand this. He's talking about resurrection life. He's not talking about the old life. He's talking about the new life in Christ that's going to be full and amazing and incredible. You see, if you think this abundant life involves possessions and money and riches, you're thinking old life. It's not that. He's talking about this new life, this spiritual life that we have in Christ Jesus. And he's saying that spiritual life is going to be a full life. Imagine a life full of God. Isn't that, do you not, okay, some of you, I'm, it's hard to tell with the face masks, but yeah, just some of you are not looking like you've caught this yet. There's a full life that you can have with God. Imagine every single moment of every single day, you're walking through, you're existing with God. Hallelujah. Isn't that great, Loco? Yay, you're with me, hallelujah. A life with God, incredible. David wrote about this in Psalm 23. I mean, David, how did David anticipate so much of what was to come in Christ Jesus? Absolutely incredible. And he says, surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And, and, and it's, it's an incredible picture of this wonderful heavenly father who looks down at you and me and, and he looks down at us and he says, Do you know what, because of the cross, because if you die to self, if you accept this new life in Jesus, then every single day I'm going to be right there with you and you know, everything I do will be out of the goodness of my heart. Everything that I bring to you will be full of love. Everything that is going to be marked by grace, I am going to be there with you and for you through everything you face. You will never have to tread on anything on your own. I will always be there to hold your hand and bring you through and I promise you it won't end here death is now defeated this life is going to go on for eternity and the temporary struggle that we have to know and sense God's presence with us now when we get to heaven when we get to eternity we will experience life with God in its absolute fullness but we can taste it now. We can taste it now. What does that life look like? There's a wonderful picture in Galatians chapter 5 where it, Paul's writing about, he's trying, I think Paul, sometimes, you know these lists that we get in scripture, I imagine Paul sitting there, scratching his head with a pen, well, I don't think he had a pen in his hand, but with a scribe, thinking, how do I explain this? How do I convey this? How do I get this across to people? How can I express this wonderful life that God gives us? And he writes in Galatians chapter 5, he says, when God fills you with the Holy Spirit, when he comes into your life, there's things just happen. It's like fruit growing on a tree. You can't stop it. You will know that you are loved. And you will be able to love. That, that in itself is just like, whoa. You will discover joy. And live in joy. Peace out of this world, peace. Incredible peace. The gentleness that comes from being led by the Holy Spirit. Incredible. Your ability to persevere and keep going because he's with you and he'll get you through. And you'll be able to exercise self-control. This is what this full life in God looks like. You see, it's about a quality of living, a quality of life, a fullness, an abundance 
of God in us and God coming out through us. Because this life, you can't contain it. Look at the empty tomb. You cannot keep resurrection life down. It will break free every single time. And the quality, the life that God is wanting to breathe into us is a life that is just indomitable, if you know what that word means. <laughs> it can't be defeated. It can't be held down. Whatever life, this physical life, chooses to throw at us, Christ in us is stronger. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. It doesn't matter the trials, it doesn't matter the struggles, it doesn't matter the difficulties. Because we have God, we can have hope. Because we have God, we can have joy. Because we have God, we have fr freedom from sin. All those struggles, all those things we wrestle with and struggle with. I don't know, I'm, I'm learning to be perfect. Yeah, I'm practicing how to be perfect. I'm practicing how to be perfect because I am no longer enslaved to sin. I have been set free by Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ. Yeah? We have, do you realize that we've been set free? All those things that you, you struggled with in life, all those things that you found difficult, Christ can free us to live perfectly with him. And notice I said, I'm still learning to be perfect. But you know what? If you're still struggling and you're still going around saying, I can't cope, I can't cope, I can't cope, then you're living in the wrong life. You need to die to that life. We need to receive the new life that is in Christ Jesus. A life that's marked with by fullness and freedom to live for him and him alone. And I could say an awful lot more but I'm watching the clock and I know some of us want to get for, home for lunch <laughs> this resurrection life is ours to live all we have to do is die Are you in? Do you want it? Yes. Let's die so that we can live.